Okay, so <coughs> welcome today. Today we will uh, uh, discuss one possible uh, domain of application of the Internet of Things architecture that we call uh, ambient intelligence. So how to use uh, the IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, to <coughs> create uh, intelligent environments, uh, intelligent ambience where uh, the, the behavior of the IoT system, as we will see, will support or help in an intelligent way their users. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have this uh, day uh, dedicated to ambient intelligence. In the afternoon, we'll try to review some more you know, uh, introductory topics and in the morning. And in the afternoon, my uh, collaborator Luigi will come and show you more practical uh, aspects how, on how we conduct the laboratories and teaching laboratories about uh, ambient intelligence. For what concerns this morning, I try to split you know, the topic in two. So uh, we will have uh, probably a break at 10.30 or something like that. So before the break, uh, I'll try to give some general uh, discussion about uh, ambient intelligence as a research field. Okay, so uh, what the, uh, the researchers do uh, for creating intelligent ambience uh, using the IoT. And the second part, uh, after the coffee, uh, before, uh, before lunch, and uh, we'll, I'll try to give you some, uh, some information to tell you something about the teaching activities that we have uh, in particular, there is one course uh, that I have at uh, the third year, at uh, the bachelor here in Politecnico, uh, where we actually try to teach this, these things uh, to undergraduate students. So it's more of a, uh, sharing what we are doing and how we organize the teaching activities in a quite uh, unusual way uh, to, to deal with these kind of topics. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less the overview of the day for today. So I will start from uh, this picture that we already seen on uh, uh, Monday, was that, uh, where I, I put together most of the most important, let's say, buzzwords or keywords for the Internet of Things. And in the previous days, hmm, uh, we have uh, uh, touched some of these aspects, like uh, uh, the second day, was about uh, connectivity, about linking sensors through wireless network. The, yesterday it was more about uh, computation, so all the data management issues and all the uh, user interface issues that are on the top, no? uh, are inside the, the applications, need some user interfaces. So we touched uh, some of these important topics. Uh, um, that are used for building a complete system. And today our focus will be on the system. So putting everything together. Maybe in a small scale, small examples, but the idea is how everything fits. So well, you, you can be an expert on wireless networks. You can be an expert on uh, big data. You can be an expert on IoT protocols. Okay, all these expertises are needed, but after all, we need someone who puts everything together and creates a working application, which is not an application, but is actually a system made, made of different parts, different uh, applications. And this application should be used and should be useful for a given group of uh, target users. And uh, in particular, for the research point of view, I want to focus on this upper part of the picture. So, putting everything together in an application and serving the needs uh, of a user group. This is what uh, the, the research topic of ambient intelligence, uh, or sometimes they call it intelligent environments. Uh, there are similar definitions by different research groups. Uh, they're trying to work at this level. So, 
trying to, we try to exploit all the innovation that we have at the protocol level, all the innovation that we have at the data mining level, all the innovation we have at the security level, and so on, and try to improve the type of applications and the type of uh, user features, user um, features that we deliver to the users at this level. So this is the focus of today, morning and afternoon. So let's start first, uh, as, as I did for the AOT, we start from the beginning, start from the definition, what is ambient intelligence? So uh, ambient intelligence is it's a very general topic, in a way, um, that covers many types uh, of, uh, of, of application areas. Uh, you can think of an intelligent environment in your home, in your workplace, in the street, uh, in the factory, shop floor, uh, in every you know, uh, defined space, closed or open space, where you know you talk with uh, urbanists or architects, uh, uh, they associate uh, behaviors or functions with spaces. So every type of space has a specific function. People exhibit some behaviors in those spaces, and our question is. Uh, how can we make uh, the space more intelligent so that the users will make uh, or will exploit their behaviors better in that space? Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, the, the idea is not new. We see that it's quite dated, actually. And so the definition is actually something that we want to describe, but, but also something that we want to happen. So I call it maybe it's a prediction, it's not just a definition. So, it's a direction in which we want to go, we would like uh, to go. Everything started, or not started, but uh, uh, became uh, more uh, known and famous with a document uh, that was released uh, um, by the European Commission after a study that the, the European Commission com commissioned uh, to a group of people to define ambient intelligence. So, uh, the title of this report was Scenarios for Ambient Intelligence in 2010. And this paper, this book, this report was published in 2001. So it's uh, 16 years old now. And it makes forecasts about uh, 2010, what the world would look like five years ago. So, like when you are seeing a, a movie in, uh, shot in the 80s uh, and it makes forecasting about, oh, then in the year 2000 we will have uh, flying cars. Uh, we don't have flying cars, we still have crashing cars and uh, more. And, uh, uh, but this uh, is an interesting overview of uh, how people in the 2000 year thought about the future of... <coughs> their, they still didn't have the, the name IoT. It was not defined. I, the Internet of Things. Uh, but they knew about the connectivity, the mobile devices, uh, uh, the, the, all these new sensors, new technologies that could be put together to make smarter environments. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to browse this report and see what actually happened and what didn't. And uh, we see that a lot of uh, technologies happened, probably much more than. Uh, what it was envisioned in this report. You know, mobile computing went much, much farther. Uh, connectivity went, went much, much farther than expected. But the actual, I'll call it, I'll call it integration into useful services didn't happen. So in this, uh, you know, the, the title of this report is scenarios. So they describe scenarios. Okay, this uh, John goes there and this happens in his house and so on. And if you read uh, some of the scenarios, uh, you can read, you can download this from the, from the, uh, from the web, it's a, it's a free report. Uh, we see that many of these, we read them, we think, okay, it's nice, it would be useful, but today we don't have yet this capability. Today, in 2017, 16 years ago, they thought that in the next uh, 10 years uh, that would happen, and in nearly 20 years, it didn't. Okay, so today, 15, 17 years later, or 16 years later, we still 
think that something should be useful so we like it we like these scenarios but we don't have the technologies and the services for doing that this is strange maybe it means that uh, we need to do more research or and or we need uh, probably to push the industry towards these goals instead of just producing newer and newer and better and better devices but that don't change uh, the ambient, change the person, change the lives, but don't change the environment too much. But let's pick, let's pick up from this uh, uh, document a definition. No? So this is uh, the initial in the abstract and the initial after of this document. We have uh, this the definition of, co of ambient intelligence that provides a vision of the information society. Okay, where the emphasis, the emphasis. Of course, we need all the technologies, uh, all the interconnectivity and so on, but the emphasis is on greater user-friendliness, more efficient, efficient service support, user empowerment. You see, it's written from the point of view of the users and support for human interactions. So not just technologies, but how the users use them, how the technology is friendly to the user, how the technology empowers the users to do more or to do better huh? or to do something with less effort people are surrounded by intelligent intuitive interfaces we do have that today especially in the smartphones and the web we have smart interfaces they are intelligent in some way they can predict what they are doing they can suggest you but they are sort of a confined world on your smartphone, on the web. The concept of having an intelligent, intuitive interface. When you walk, you don't know, into an ATM to pick up your money or into some public space, and you go to a hospital, to a office, okay, you don't see an intelligent interface that helps you doing whatever you want to do. So this uh, uh, great improvement interface happen but happen only in specific fields um, because this intelligent intuitive interfaces should be embedded in all kinds of objects and no kind of objects so we they didn't have uh, the name internet of things at the time but basically they are describing that they are describing something more than the internet of things we saw that in the, in the IoT definition objects uh, have, do have connectivity, do have addressing capability, can exchange data. Here, what they say is that the objects can also offer user interaction. Objects can be the elements of user interaction. Objects are used tasks by the user, can collect data from the user, can provide information to the user. So it's not just a device that you know does some technical function, but it's also a device that does some interface function. And uh, we should have an environment, this room, for example, that is capable of recognizing and responding to the presence of different individuals in a seamless, unobtrusive, and often invisible way. Uh, for doing what they don't tell. But actually, it's the environment uh, that should, in some way, sense the presence of users, understand the actions or the needs of those users, and respond, responding to the presence in an invisible and a seamless way. So we don't need, uh, we shouldn't need, you know, a smartphone application to switch the light on or off, or to close the curtains or to do whatever home automation that we have today. Today we have a lot of home automation, build automation, but they are all reactive systems. We give comments, the system executes. That is not intelligence. That is automation. We have, we don't have intelligent buildings. We have automated buildings. The next step will be the building to understand what it needs to do and do it before or without anybody needing to give the comment. Otherwise, you know, switching a light on by pushing on this button, or, okay, we push, 
probably later. If, yeah, it does. Huh? Okay. Or by opening a smartphone application and navigating through menus and then finding the library which is gone. I don't feel it's a progress. I don't think it's better to have something which is very intuitive, very direct into the environment, action, and turn that into something that is more distant, <coughs> more detached, farther from uh, just one more layer, cognitive layer, between the user and the action that he wants to do. So we should try to not to add one interface, probably to remove that. So my idea was to switch the light on by pointing at it, or by saying light, for example. So without, I don't need, I, I need less technology, not more. Okay, more technology, but hidden. That doesn't get in the way. Or, even better, a light that self-regulates automatically. How complex could be an algorithm for self-regulating the light? Stupid. We have something. No, we have systems that are far, far more complex. So why do we still have? You know, we, we, I am talking you know, uh, very simple things. This has a cost. You have the buttons, you have the files, you have the wiring, and you have the maintenance when it breaks up, uh, breaks down, and so on. But why we not take it just have one microprocessor like, costing two euros? Controlling the light by itself. It would cost more, uh, it would cost less. Must have. And would give a better service. So we are in the social, whatever you want, uh, mobile, uh, immersive, uh, but we still have uh, in our buildings the technology of the beginning of the center, of the last century. Hmm? Think about it. Okay, this was one definition, which is, you know, something published uh, 17 years ago, one thinks it's obsolete. Actually, no. It touches a very real problem, still unsolved and still important today. Okay, we have, uh, I, I, I searched into several uh, research papers uh, about the other definitions of ambient intelligence that were developed and proposed by different researchers through the years, you know, more or less they all say this, they all tell the same thing. Uh, um, increasingly make our every hour, everyday environment. So we are not talking about uh, nuclear uh, power plants, or maybe also, but not specifically. The goal here is to take everyday places so imagine from the morning uh, when you wake up in the morning the list of places the environment where you spend your time and how each of them could be made more intelligent your parking your bar when you go to have uh, a breakfast uh, the office where you're going to pay your taxes the office where you're working the streets that you are, that you are crossing and so on each of these, in very simple things, in very simple ways, like today, it's much easier to phone, to phone people, to message people, much, much easier than, you know, 17 years ago. How can we make easier also the living or occupying or uh, uh, using those spaces that we use every day? A potential future in which we will be surrounded by intelligent objects and in which, and this we are, you know, with smartphones and computers, we are surrounded by intelligent objects, but in the environment we recognize the presence of person and respond in an undetectable manner. This doesn't happen yet. Hmm? Implies intelligence around us, and so on. We'll see more about this definition in a, in a second, about the, the explanation of some of these adjectives like sensitive, adaptive, and so on. Um, so, the, the, but the common theme here is that ambient intelligence talks about users, about humans, not about technology. 
So I like uh, all, of all of these uh, definitions, I like two of them. I, I was thinking that the very few words capture the essence of what you are trying to do. The first is a definition by uh, Diane Cook, she's a researcher at the, in the United States, uh, 2009, so it's eight, nine years ago. She wrote in a paper, um, an ambient intelligence system is a digital environment, okay, we know that, that proactively but sensibly support people in their daily life. Okay, so I think there are four words here. Supports people. So it makes something easier for people. <coughs> daily. Every time. Not just in some specific task. In every task. And then there are two terrible adjectives, or no, adverbs, that are proactively and sensitive. Proactively means uh, that the system proactive should be active before. The system should act, should, should act, first of all, should do something. And should do something before the user even asks for that. That is proactive not a, a reactive system, something that acts after or in response to a request. Proactive is something that acts before. So, for acting before, you, the system must understand what the user wants uh, without asking to the user, just by understanding, by monitoring, by mm, analyzing the behaviors and so on. And this is something that, you know, when you go to the Amazon shopping website, uh, and when you're looking, uh, Amazon tells you, maybe you want to buy this. So it tries to be proactive. Advertising is all about proactivity today. Trying to put something that could that you could use before you, you even know about it or surely before you ask about it. When you're asking for something, it's too late mm -hmm. for, for advertising your products because you already have made your mind. So all that intelligence that today we have uh, in you know in advertising, in a, in navigation system. You have an, your GPS navigator, and at a given point, the navigator says, Oh, maybe you should wish you switch your way because I found a better alternative. Because I know more than you, I know what's behind the corner. And so, before you ask me, please find the alternative routes or whatever, I will offer you. Say, Okay, if you, if you change your way, it will be two minutes faster. Hmm? And so on. So, there are some uh, contexts in which this proactivity happens. We, will, we want to translate it to the environment. And the other is sensibly. That the word is sensibly where it is really difficult. This is a difficult one. Because it's very easy to do something proactively. I propose you a lot of different stuff every time. But then I, the risk is overflowing you with not so useful information or not so useful actions. So, Doing something which is sensible, sensible means uh, exactly what you would expect in that moment, mm. is very difficult. Even between persons, no, which are intelligent by definition, it's very difficult to understand what another person wa wants in this, in this moment. Mm. So this is the, the goal that we want to reach. Another. Um, Definition, which is uh, provided by Juan Augusto, who is a Spanish professor that now it works in the UK. So these two names, Diane Cook and Juan Augusto, are the two probably most important persons in this, in this field. And he gave uh, um, a definition in, uh, uh, of intelligent environment uh, where the, it's a more technology-oriented definition, where the actions of numerous network controllers that are controlling different aspects of the environment is orchestrated. So we have a distributed system with many different controllers that are orchestrated. So they work together with a common goal by self-programming preemptive processes, strong buzzwords that say, okay, intelligent software actually, in such a way to create an interactive holistic functionality. He likes big words. Holistic function, holistic function, I mean, that takes into account everything that enhances occupants' experiences. 
So that's always the ultimate goal. Okay, so actually all these definitions tend to tell us the same thing. Okay, you, are, you can do IoT, you can create IoT systems. Okay, so what is the goal of the system? It should be to improve the behavior of the, or to make the behavior of an environment more intelligent for the users that, that live in it and they use it and so on. So this domain of, having, of intelligent uh, environments or having intelligence includes a lot of uh, technologies. To develop a, a system with these characteristics, you need uh, sensors, you need the networks, uh, you need uh, interfaces, you need artificial intelligence, you need uh, um, miniaturization and ubiquitous computing, you need uh, data processing and so on. So uh, it's linked with uh, many other research fields that are more you know, technology fields. And here we are in a system design, system level field. Okay, so I try to simplify an ambient intelligence system, AMI stands for ambient intelligence, just for short, an AMI system, an AMI system. I try to simpl simplify it by thinking of a loop containing four different steps, four main steps. So every MEA system should have some sensing capabilities, sensors, sensors that try to understand the situation, understand the user, understand what the user is doing through sensing in the environment. Some reasoning capabilities, we'll go into detail in a second. Um, some reasoning capabilities where all this sensor, sensor data, and you have seen yesterday how much data can, some sensors can, can generate, and tomorrow morning when you visit the big data lab, uh, you see that, okay, sensor data is not just a concept, but it's a <laughs> big uh, pack of hardware to store and to process. And uh, uh, extracting some decision about this data. Okay, I saw the temperature, I have the humidity, I have the illumination, I have the number of persons, and so, and so I can decide something. I can understand, I can reason about the data and decide what actions I could do. And then I need an infrastructure for acting these actions for actually performing this action. So, I decide that this room is too dark. Okay, I should be able to light it up. So, I should have the infrastructure for you know, commanding the light. I understand that this room is too hot or too humid, uh, really, you know, it's not just the temperature the humidity in here that is uh, causing us. Um, and so, I, the reasoning can detect this, this situation can detect that there are people inside, so it's wise to spend energy to make the comfort better, but then there should be an active way. So a lot of uh, IoT systems don't have this part. You remember the visit that we make in, T in Telecom on, on Monday? They have the first two actually. They have a lot of sensors, and they have a nice platform that shows you the data shows you some alerts, some, some charts, some warnings, some situations, and then the system is not doing anything proactively. It's just presenting, organizing your data, which is important, right, of course, but it doesn't give the final users any benefit, direct benefit. We have all the technology, when we are going up to there, and we are not doing the last step of doing actually something useful. We have all the data, and all the data just sits there and is useless unless somebody is looking at it now. But it's not the final user that can look at it or can be, it's not even interested. I, as a final user, I'm not interested in the traffic lights in another town or, or in the uh, you know, in what happens in the smart bench uh, in another square. I am interested in my surrounding, where to park my car. If, tra if traffic light is, is green, if 
for my street, for me, for example. No? So all these smart cities are very good at collecting data, but fail at, at the acting part. So what do we do? Uh, of course, acting uh, is also implies also a trust, trust issues. So I should trust the system to do some actions autonomously. But it was what we are doing every day. Uh, you take an elevator, you push a button, and you trust. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's not it's not that different. Hmm? Uh, the the issue is that we have a lot of you know, so-called IoT systems that today don't work well because they are not well designed. And so the trust of people is getting lower instead of higher. And the final part is the interaction. A system that doesn't interact with the user, I don't call it an ambient intelligence system. I call it a smart, uh, an intended control system. So you can have a very powerful, I think about the, the, the comfort in the room. So in many classrooms, for example, we have very big uh, um, what's the English for that? Air, air treating unit? In English. Okay. Uh, uh, every, behind every classroom, there is a big machine that processes the air. Uh, and so, control the, the temperature, control the CO2 levels, control the dust, uh, and there are con air conditioners that warm it up uh, or cool it, uh, or uh, they can recycle the internal air or pull some air from the outside. So, do all sorts of uh, intelligent decisions to keep the climate in a classroom within a given range of CO2, a given range of humidity, a given range of temperature. So it's, a, it's an intelligent system. It applies a lot of uh, decisions, algorithms, and so on, without the user knowing so on. So I would call that an intelligent control system. It controls a behavior. It has a control loop. It has sensors. It, it has applied algorithms, very nice math lab simulations. And, and then it acts. Uh, it controls the temperature, the air conditioning, and so on, and so on. But the users don't have any way of interacting with that system. If it works, fine, otherwise we don't know what to do. Or we don't need to interact. So it's a closed system that optimizes, uh, is built for optimizing some physical quantities, some technical features. You have uh, your, you know, you have some solar panels in the roof of your house that produce energy. You have uh, uh, you know, some device in your house that consume energy. So there is always a decision on whether to consume the energy from the sun, to store it in the battery, to sell it to the utility, and so on. So, there is a small <coughs> computer that takes all these decisions every time for people who have some sort of uh, co-generation plan. Again, this is something that it just need, doesn't need to interact with the user. It just makes the system more efficient. It's an intelligent control system. We are aiming at more. If I have an intelligent control system in my house, I can be sure, or I can hope, that at the end of the month I will pay a lower bill, probably. Or, do you have time? Actually, I would like to, sorry for the idea of this you. I would like to know, uh, how many of you want to come to the visit Boella tomorrow morning? Okay, so put simply,
So the, um, for tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, the meeting point is in front of Boyle. Okay. Actually, if you want to come, you can join the other people. Uh, Boyle is close to Mixco. Maybe you know Mixco? Where well, you can go and eat. Do you want to buy it? You are you are there. Yes. So just in front of Boyle. Okay. At uh, uh, half past nine. nine. Ah, nine thirty. Nine past nine. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we were discussing about these four main steps hmm? and uh, more detail what the system can do about sensing. Okay, we already discussed that in the first day that today we have, uh, you know, really all kinds uh, of sensors that you can imagine and in particular we have sensors in, in two broad categories environment sensors that can measure some quant physical quantity the light uh, the temperature the, the you know the opening or closing of a door but they are sensing quantities about the environment and then we have uh, human sensors that can assess you know, the position, the movement, the body temperature, the sweating status, the voice, uh, the, the actions of the user. So both types of sensors uh, are available today. And uh, uh, for example, here we have uh, some categories of, uh, of sensors and some possible applications of these sensors inside uh, a smart environment hmm? uh, but as I say it's a, it's a very very large world and every time the electronics and the mechatronics are providing us with new type of, of devices hmm? for sensing data so we already saw this picture last day uh, the issue is that uh, these sensors of course produce data every minute, every second, every 15 minutes, uh, whatever other program to act, they produce a new value. And this sensor data is very hard to process. First of all, it's a huge amount of data, not they call it big data. Because uh, if you take uh, maybe some hundred sensors that provide data every five minutes, for one year, you have uh, millions of records. 
And in every measurement you will take maybe temperature, humidity, lightning, uh, uh, so on, four or five numbers. Uh, you have very easily hundreds of millions of numbers. And these numbers are very noisy. It's not a very nice, clean, certified measure. It's not a measure taken from a high quality measurement laboratory. They will tell you a, a number which is crisp, which is re repeatable, and so on. Why? Because all the sensor need to cost, to need to have a very low cost. So there will be compromises, trade-offs on the precision, on the repeatability, on the drift of these values. Huh? Uh, so, the kind of data that you take from one measurement of an LT system is usually useless because you cannot rely on that single sample. You need to do an average over time, you need to do an average or a comparison over space to validate, to try to remove the noise from the data. Yeah. An energy data, an energy sample taken one hour every 15 minutes, that happens uh, frequently. Okay, if when you are making the measurement, some big equipment is starting up, you will have a very high uh, measurement. But that doesn't mean anything, because it's very, a small spike that doesn't contribute too much to the overall energy consumption, for example. Hmm? So, uh, <coughs> these data are not directly reliable. They have a lot of uh, 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 margin error, and also systematic errors, you know, because these sensors tend to drift when they get older. You have a lot of missing points. Missing point means that, okay, you have your monitoring system that will give you one measurement every five minutes, uh, but then something happens. Uh, the light goes out, the energy, electric excited energy, you have a blackout. You have the internet that breaks out, a, you have an internet uh, problem. You have some, you know, any kind of problem can interrupt the delivery of, of this data. So in your database, when you're trying to do the average or to draw a, a graph, there are some minutes, days, months that are missing. Because maybe a sensor broke down and somebody realizes that only two months later. And then it took two more months to replace it, to find the right component. And it's normal. These are not critical sensors, of course. So they don't have any 24-hour repair policy. And so, but when you're doing your statistics, and you say, okay, what is the total energy consumption of the year? You cannot just sum the numbers. Because you're summing a series, you're making the sum of a series of numbers when you're old. So the total will not be correct. If you're making an average, it will not be correct. If you are comparing this month to the same month last year, it will not be correct. Because who knows whether there were any problems last year this time. Hmm? So it's very, these, are, these data are very difficult to handle. You make a very nice mathematical model, you apply it to the data, and then <laughs> it just shits out of, out of that. Because, uh, because all, a lot of these details need to be taken into account. Even when you are doing the average, you cannot just make the sum and divide by the number, because depending on the period. Uh, measures, and this is very risky, the NASA, the space NASA, has lost uh, some, some, some uh, spaceships for this. Heterogeneous measures. Okay, I have an energy sensor. Good. What does it measure? Watts, kilowatts, watt towers, joules, kilowatt towers. Any of these would be okay. But every sensor probably could have a different measure. If you go to the industrial setting, you have the tri-phase energy. So uh, are you measuring the energy of a single phase, the total uh, energy? You are you measuring the active power or the react also the reactive one? Okay, there are many different kinds of measures. Every sensor risk to have uh, a different so if you have a, a building with two sensors it's okay but if you have the same sensor installed over time 
Well, okay, this device is then just to give you a number. But what is the unit of measure of this number? What is the time interval over which that number is being, has been computed? And these are, okay, it's a, it's a basic measurement theory here. Uh, this information must be known, otherwise you cannot process the number. You have five and seven, but you cannot compare five with seven. You can compare five kilowatt hours taking the last five minutes uh, with seven, maybe 100,000 taking the last 20 minutes. If you know that, you can compare. Otherwise, they are just numbers. You can just throw them away. Hmm? So whenever you say, you hear somebody saying, OK, you have a lot of sensor data, start asking yourself questions whether they really understand them. Hmm? I remember. When we were in Telecom, I noticed that they showed uh, uh, the traffic in Barcelona or whatever, for La Coruña, in Spain, and the traffic in another Italian city, I don't know whether it was Torino or Firenze or whatever. And the unit of measure was different uh, of cars per minute versus cars per hour. So, even a very simple thing like that, you can have different. Now, and if you are not careful and you try to do a, an overview of an overall picture, and try to put this data together, you are going to fail. And um, so, in a sense, the raw data by itself <laughs> is not very useful. That you can never use it. You need to have a set of processed data that is more reliable and that uh, be filtered, validated, uh, wrong measurements are being deleted, uh, and so on. And uh, bad periods have been tagged, uh, and so on. Uh, and by the way, a number all only makes sense if you know the how and the where it was taken. So, an, an energy measurement, uh, you, okay, you must also say when, time. So every number should be time spent and uh, localized. So you must know where this measure was taken. Okay, in a building, the location maybe don't change by themselves, but while the, wheel, the building evolves, a given measurement, because we are doing, modifying the plants and so on, given measurement may refer to a different part of the building. Mm -hmm. So, all these are just careful or care uh, uh, issues that you should be careful with uh, when you're processing this data. But so after all, we have this data, you try to put that in a form that is reliable. And this is where software takes, uh, takes, uh, takes place. All the reasoning, all the intelligence. So you need people writing algorithms for doing something useful with this data. Because up to now, we just did a service to the sensors, making their data better. Now we need to make a, start making a service to the users. Decide something, some actions, reasoning about some actions to decide, taking into account of the data. Hmm? So, this is just actually the software part, the software architecture. We'll see that better in, in the afternoon. Okay? So, we need to develop a system that takes this data with all those warnings they gave you about sensor data and uh, reasons. Applies an algorithm and uh, decides an action. Answer. And uh, well, okay, you are just main, but I, I, I probably should skip some of this. So the next step would be acting. As I said, many IoT systems are missing this, don't have this. Acting means uh, modifying the environment according to some decision that the software took, or to some situation that the software detected. Modifying actually the environment. Modifying the light, modifying the temperature, modifying the sound, modifying the opening or closing of the doors, uh, switching on and off some system, or whatever. Okay? Um, and we have also, like with sensors, we have the technology for that. Since decades, these are just some pictures of some home automation systems where we have the, some relays, and we have some smart plugs and so on that are controlled and through a software command you can switch on or off a device, uh, on or off a light, uh, you can command the motor or whatever. All the automation industry is also in the home automation. 
or in the building automation. So there, is, there are components, there are technologies, there are standards for doing, for acting everywhere. There are not many, there are not very, what? Compared to sensors, we know the sense that the number of sensors that there are in a, in a building or in a city is always increasing. The number of actuators, not so much. And especially the number of actuators that are, com uh, that are driven directly by an intelligent system. So you may be in your home, you have an, 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 an automatic gate, you have the automation in your gate or in your uh, doors. When you are like, driving your car home, you can uh, open it, uh, with, but with your direct control, a reactive system. It's not very intelligent at all. You just push a button, it decodes the number, and open the gate. Uh, so there are actuators, but uh, in many cases, in most cases, they are not linked to the intelligent system. But they still rely on the human evaluation. So the reasoning of now I need to open the gate is not a reasoning of the system, it's a reason of the human, the user, that presses a button. So we are missing a bigger opportunity here. And then the user interaction is also essential, because the user usually interacts with the environment. So I enter the room, so the light gets switched on, the window gets closed, so what, or whatever. But then, I, sh I should also be able to interact with the environment, maybe for setting my preferences, uh, for giving some comments, uh, through different kinds of devices. And the interaction can be through web pages, mobile devices, but also through the environment itself. Huh? So maybe if something is knocking at the door, or somebody sorry, is knocking or ringing the bell, maybe the lights in my house can blink or can change color to tell me something for communicating with you. So if we have some acting on the environment, uh, this acting, so the changing of the situation of the environment, can also be used to communicate. We have a dialogue with the user. Doing something that the user will perceive and will understand. <coughs> so you can have maybe the light switching off because you are switching the TV on. So if we all uh, switch the, te the television on, and uh, the system understands you want to watch a movie and will lower the lights. So this is just a, a very simple intelligent behavior. It's not just communication. It's, it's improving the environment uh, for the user needs. But then the same lights could blink uh, if somebody is calling you over the phone or whatever. Maybe the, the movie is uh, put into the pause automatically or whatever. Hmm? So, the system can tell you things. Uh, okay, the simplest thing would be to send you a notification on your mobile. But we don't want to do everything through our mobile. We want to do something through our environment. And the easiest way of uh, interacting is just interacting with what, with what is already there. In the house. So, for example, the buttons. Uh, initially, I said I think maybe we should remove them or because they cost more than an automatic system, actually, we can do better. We can rewire them. Instead, of, because people are so accustomed to traditional interfaces, they are so natural, they are so intuitive, they have 100 years of history, so they have been optimized a lot, not this one, just some plastic, low-cost plastic. Um, and so we can use the same user interface with, with a different, in a different way. It will not be just one wire that will uh, come, uh, uh, drive directly the lens. But it will be one signal, one sensor, one button that will be sensor, and the effect of this sensor can be processed by the system. It's not like an uh, example that we made on Monday, like it happened with the cars. When you press a brake, you're not commanding directly the brake itself. You are giving an input to a sensor behind the brake pedal that will reason and then act on the brake in an optimal way. Okay. But we keep the interfaces that are familiar to the users. 
plus the web interfaces, of course, plus the mobile interfaces, of course, plus all, all kind of uh, natural interfaces. You know, if you have some kids that is fond of video games, there are, um, there are many games, uh, you know, what, what's called that? Uh, Just Dance, you know the game? Just Dance. It's a, it's a game where you are some dancers, okay, in, the, in, your, in your video game, and you need to make the same movements as the dancers. And the, and the camera in the, in the video game console looks at you and checks whether you are doing these movements correctly. So, there's no interface, no button to flex. It's your, your body becomes the interface. Your gestures. So, if you do that for gaming, you can do that for everything else. Switching the light on could be just a gesture. Opening the door could be another gesture, for example. We have the technology for that. We, they sell it for video games at, at 30 euros. Why can't we use it for making our environment more intelligent? Hmm? Uh, so this aspect should be probably the first to think about. So, okay, I'm building a very complex system, an IoT system intelligent with sensors and so on. Okay, but how will the users see it? What are there? Ever, you know, you have a big, very big iceberg of a lot of technologies, but the tip of this iceberg is much high, very, very small, it's the only part that the user sees. And the part that the user sees is how do I interact with this? So it's a, a small part. We are more, you, in many cases, we are more concentrated with the big bulk of the iceberg, but the user is only focused on the small tip. So we should start thinking about that. Because otherwise, all the rest of our technology would be useless, because the users will not use it. Yeah, they will just put some tape and handwriting, don't use it. Don't touch. I don't know what happens. I don't understand how it works. I don't feel it useful. I'm not willing to pay for it, and so on. So a lot of opportunities, I'm sure that, are missed because we don't think about the users. Which is a mistake that the mobile developers are not making. Every new mobile app is highly addictive, easy to use. You see three years old boys or girls that can use a tablet. They cannot use a computer. A mouse is too difficult to use for a three years old boy. A tablet or a smartphone is easier. It's more natural, it's more direct. This is not by chance, okay? There were 40 years of research on user interaction that makes the, the way a smartphone works or a tablet works easier, much easier, less cognitive demanding. You don't need to be able to read. Them. You can use a, a, a smartphone even if you, you, before you learn to, how to read. Even before you, you have the dexterity or the eye-hand coordination to move a mouse and so on. So, there are research results in many fields uh, and you know, look at the automotive and look at the mobile uh, industries. They are very far, uh, uh, they are very farther uh, ahead of us. As examples, look at these industries, examples of how to create the user interfaces, the user engagement something that is easy to use and fun to use and so on. The only thing we should do, only, is uh, not just having everything captive inside the smartphone, but uh, spread out over the environment. Not just into the small screen, but the whole house, the whole building will be our smartphone in the future. Hmm? Probably. And this is, is something that is very uh, well represented in the industries. There are a lot of uh, industrial sectors, industries with money, that are thinking about uh, the, uh, the market of uh, smartphones or smart buildings in more in general. And you see, you go to Amazon, you go to a shopping center, a lot of products from different products and services from different uh, companies, but more for different industrial sectors. 
that are trying to conquer your heart, to be the master of your heart. Alexa, Amazon is trying to sell you the Alexa device. Google with the Google Voice. But then you have your telecom operator that will sell you the uh, internet uh, router, and on the internet router you, you will have the offer of watching TVs, television, over your so and uh, also of having security service on top of that. Uh, two weeks ago I was talking with this, an insurance company, uh, insurance for the house, for the anti theft and so on, and so they want to sell you some smartphone devices that the, user com uh, the insurance company can know what happens in your house. They already are doing that with the cars. Uh, the electronics, Market. You buy a TV, today is a smart TV. So, you know, the Samsung, for example, is selling you devices that where they try to push their own control, their own automation into your house. You will buy a fridge, it will be, it will be a smart fridge. So, the people that yesterday were building televisions, insurance policies, uh, fridges, and so on, today they are building and selling IoT systems. Each of them with their own specific business model. The consumer electronics has the business model of selling many small goods to you every six months, or three, or every day, but hopefully we, don't, we are not there yet. Uh, the telecom operator want to sell you a service that you will pay month by month in the next 10 years. Totally different model. Once I sell you something, I, I can forget about you, consumer industry. Service industry, I give you a small fee every month, and then it will sum up. So the products uh, that you find in the market are embedding the logic, the business logic of the industry behind that. You have, uh, People who are used to build uh, electrical plants, electrical components, they are selling you some home automation systems. Every major manufacturer of devices is now selling as a specific line of, of home automation products. They probably cost more, they need to be installed with, by a uh, technician, you cannot install them by yourself. Probably they will last 20 years instead of 6 months. Because that is the business model of the, of the plant industries. So many different industries, each with their own times, with their own revenue models and so on, are trying to fight to be the owner of this market. And the only person which is abandoned is the user. Say, okay, but you are, everybody's trying to come to my house and say how to do things, but can we maybe think about what I need? And this is not, uh, you know, on my view, I, I have to, this, these two tweets uh, that I, I like, they are from, from 2014. You know, O'Reilly is uh, one of the biggest uh, editors of technical publications. And every year he organizes uh, conferences about open source and so on. And says, the, okay, the IoT should not be just the IoT Internet of Things, but should be the Internet of Things and humans. It requires thinking about how humans and things cooperate differently when things get smart. So you have a smart, much smarter system, but then the user is not considered the design system. This is a very big design mistake. And uh, as this man also says, which is a high famous consultant, most of what we need for smart cities already exists. We don't need more technology. Okay, more technology the better, but let's start maybe thinking about services. What do we do with these technologies? Demonstrations, prototypes, dashboards, reports. Okay, it's boring. Let's do something that really impacts citizens in their life in how they interact with the city, with the building, with an office, and so on. And the technology for doing that, we already have it since several years. But you need to put together all the aspects and also the service providers with a uh, sustainable business model.
Okay. Um, I think that. Okay, we can stop here. I just. Uh, uh, what, what we are missing is just uh, uh, some adjectives about uh, the characteristics, uh, the additional characteristics of, of an MEI system. Mm -hmm. But these are, I think, uh, again, by browsing the literature, I found these six uh, main topics. Uh, an MEI system should be sensitive, responsive, adaptive, transparent, ubiquitous, and intelligent. More or less, we touch this uh, in our examples without defining them. But if you want, uh, the definitions are in these slides that, that follow here. So you have them and uh, you, you, you can read them. Mm -hmm. So in summary, what we are trying to do is finding a way of designing ambient intelligence systems. System is not a device. It's a system composed of many devices that is very, that in the design process, takes into account very strongly, very explicitly, the user, the user needs, the user behaviors. It's not something that works everywhere for everybody. No, it's a system that works in that building for those people who live there. Highly personalized, highly specific. Should be able to act on the environment, not just monitor it, and should be able to interact with the users, not just being hidden, but also uh, giving some, the, some, some dialogue to the users. And, okay, should use this kind of uh, technology features uh, in their building. Mm -hmm. So this is the, our goal, no? put it, put it together a system of this. So what I propose now is to go for a coffee, and then later I will tell you, and we will tell you something, that how we try to construct systems with these characteristics with our students in our course. After the break, uh, we'll see how. From the, this is from the theoretical research point of view. Okay, in practice, how we do that in the teaching uh, domain. Okay, so we know the bar is downstairs. <laughs>